Hey, this is Guy from New Plastic, and today we're going to dive deep into subsurface scattering. In this video, we'll go over how each element of the material works, how it relates to physics, so we can get a better understanding on why those elements work the way they do. And at the end, I'll quickly run through how I implement it in a scene. In the next video, I'll go over how to achieve the look on some real life materials like marble, wax, silica, aerogel, and other materials that have different types of subsurface scattering. I also made a new pack of 36 different real life subsurface scattering materials like soap, beeswax, candle wax, porcelain, milk glass, marble, cheese, butter, candy, silica aerogel, epoxy resin, and silicone rubber, all fully procedural for only a few dollars. If you feel like it can help you, you got the link in the description. Every dollar helps the channel. This pack as well as this project file will be available to my patrons and YouTube members. If you want to join in and get all these perks, check me out on patreon.com slash new plastic or hit the join button on YouTube. Both subscriptions cost the same and enjoy the same perks and both truly help the channel grow and get better. So thank you. Shout out to the amazing patrons and members, Spencer Clark, Abhishek Singh, Lynn, KV Davey, Sean Austin, Tech Yuan, Just Hope Out, Elad, 3D Monkey Biz, Kaylor, Jake, Marcus Arnold, Connor McSheffrey, and Zetsk. You're all family now. Follow me on Instagram at ojang, subscribe, comment, share, hit the bell, blah, 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 blah. Let's go. Okay, so first off, let's talk physics. Now, granted, I'm very ignorant when it comes to physics, so some of the stuff that I describe here might sound wrong or cringy to a scientist, but even if it's not 100% scientifically right, it will at least help us understand better why things in Octane work the way they do when it comes to subsurface scattering. Also, this information can definitely be relevant to other rendering engines, as they all use the exact same or very similar options when building a subsurface scattering material. So when we look at the material, a light ray has to hit it for us to see it, right? So once the material gets hit by a light ray, it does three things to it. It reflects it, absorbs it, and transmits it. When a material transmits the light through it, it's essentially transparent because the light rays pass all the way through the material and bounce back into our eyes from whatever is behind uh, the object. Direct reflection and absorption are directly related to each other. The material directly reflects some of the light frequencies back to us. Those frequencies dictate the color we perceive the outside surface of the material to be, also known as the albedo. The rest of the frequencies are not being reflected because they're being absorbed. So what happens to the absorbed light? Two things can happen. The light can either convert into another form of energy, like heat, which means it becomes invisible to us, or it can get scattered inside the material, hitting the particles inside and reflecting from them in different directions and back out of the material. The frequencies that reflect from inside the material back into our eyes are the colors we see inside the material. That, essentially, is what we call subsurface scattering. Our 3D materials have nodes for each of those behaviors. Albedo for the direct reflection, transmission or transparency for the transmission, and in Octane we have the medium node for absorption. Before we get into it, it's important to set the right kernel settings. When you deal with SSS, it's always better to be on the path tracing or PMC kernel. Otherwise, you won't get the right light bounces inside the object to get the right effect. Here I have the scene with 14 specular depth, didn't touch the ray epsilon, and I cranked the GI clamp to 100. Lately, I've been noticing how having the usual 10 GI clamp that I have has a tendency to render glass objects slightly darker, especially if I have many of them. I also cranked the highlight compression up, and uh, I work in linear response with 2.2 gamma, and I got the noiser on. Also, I have a simple scene here with a backlight and an HDRI set to very low power. So the backlight is really the most powerful thing here. All right, so let's take a look at the medium node. First off, to access the medium node, the material needs to be transmissive. So either use a specular material or better yet, use a universal material with transmission turned all the way up. We're gonna talk about the transmission type later. One more thing we want to do is to go to the common tab and check the fake shadows. Without it, the transparency will appear darker unless you crank up the GI clamp and the specular depth. Also, in order for the universal material to be transmissive, the albedo needs to be black. The lighter the albedo is, the less transmissive it will be. In the medium node, we have three different types. Let's add the absorption first. This node tells the material to only absorb the light and not scatter it. That means the light will enter the material and gradually become invisible. The slower it becomes invisible, the deeper we can see inside the material. If the light ray is absorbed too slowly, it will completely pass through the material and will make it transparent. So the first thing we have is density. That tells Octane how dense the particles are inside the material. The denser they are, the more light will be absorbed and the more opaque the material will be. And when I mean absorbed, I mean turn into another form of energy and become invisible to us. Now, let me skip these for a second and jump through the absorption. If invert absorption is checked, 
then the color you feed here will be the color not absorbed. Remember, absorbed color turns into other forms of energy, so it becomes invisible. So if invert absorption is checked, the color you put here is the color that will be visible. In real life, the frequency that's absorbed is the color that will become invisible, which means you'll see the inverted color. If you feed in full black color, all the lights will be absorbed, so no color will be visible, which means black. If you feed in full white, none of the color will be absorbed, and the light rays will just transmit all the way through the material, which will make it transparent. Now, volume and volume shadow ray step length didn't make huge differences. This basically has to do with how far the algorithm calculates the rays getting into the object. If you're dealing with very tiny objects, try decreasing the step length. Uh, and see if it makes a difference. I honestly didn't see much of a difference. Lock step length, not sure what it means and couldn't find information about it, but didn't find it to make such a significant difference. Sample position displacement, I think this has to do more with volumetric objects. I think all these have to do with volumetric objects like fog and smoke, so it won't make much of a difference for subsurface scattering. Now, let's take a look at the next medium, the scattering medium. Here, we have the same options as we did before, except these two added features scattering and phase. Let's plug a color node to the absorption, which as we learned, will tell Octane what color is not being absorbed because we have invert absorption checked. Now we know this color is being reflected back to us. Now we can tell Octane that we don't want that color to simply reflect back. We want it to be scattered. And for that, we're going to use the scattering node. Let's start with a simple float node. If I plug a zero float node, which is black, I'm telling Octane not to scatter that color. It is still directly reflecting back to us. And depending on the density, some of it is still transmitting through the object. So it's somewhat transparent. We're basically at the same point we were. However, if I start increasing the float, that color will start to scatter more and more. Those red color frequencies start to move to random directions all over they're not coming back directly into our eyes and they're not transmitting through the object this basically diffuses the color more and more and if we raise the float to very high numbers that color is completely diffused and we don't see it anymore to get a bit more technical this is telling octane how quickly the light gets in before it's scattering the lower the float is the longer it takes for the light ray to enter the object before it scatters so if the float numbers are really high the light starts to scatter as soon as it hits the surface which is why it's not transparent anymore and because it scatters all over the place we're not getting those red frequencies back into our eyes anymore we're getting all sorts of frequencies which makes it kind of like white this is a nice start to achieve like a waxy material, the absorption color dictates the color of the wax, and the scattering float amount dictates how much that color diffuses from the inside. But we can also plug a color node into the scattering. So if we plug a blue color, we're not only telling Octane not to absorb this color, we're telling a different color to be scattered. So the absorption color is still being reflected back to us, but the scattered color is being scattered. Now we're starting to get a unique mixture of different wavelengths from different areas. Uh, I think we're also starting to step further away from real physics here, which shows that it's not that important once you have a very basic understanding of how to control these elements all you really got to do is work with your eyes now the phase dictates which direction the scattering happens when the phase is set as zero we get isotropic scattering where the light rays scatter in many different random directions that's the most common form of light scattering when the phase is set at minus one, we get backward scattering, where the light scatters mostly back towards the light source. And with phase set at one, we get forward scattering, which you guessed it, the light scatters mostly forward and away from the light source. Forward and backward scatterings are not as common in objects and materials and are more uh, effects you can see in fog, water, cosmic fogs and large mediums like those. But you can obviously use that creatively to get different looks that you want. In the emission, you can plug one of the emission nodes and essentially further illuminate the objects from within. I honestly barely use it, uh, but perhaps you want to create like a translucent object that have a light source inside it. So this could help the effect. And if I turn off the external light source, uh, you can see that with emission plugged in, we get illumination inside. Awesome, we're almost done. The last medium node we have is random walk. This is a fairly new medium added in Octane 2020, I think, and essentially it does the same thing as the scattering medium, but using a different algorithm. Random walk is a concept in mathematics used to calculate the random change of a certain number in a certain environment, from calculating a fluctuating stock price or the odds of a dice roll, or more relevant to us, the path of a particle inside a material, a phenomenon known as Brownian motion. So here in Octane, when the light particles get randomly scattered around inside our object, this specific node uses 
uses the random walk mathematical model to calculate how the light particles will be moving around when they're scattering. Apparently, this is a faster calculation and more realistic one, which leads to faster render times and also is able to obtain more surface details on the object that sometimes get lost when using subsurface scattering. That's why the random walk medium is preferable for skin, for example. You get subsurface scattering and you don't lose all the fine details of the skin that helps sell the look. Also, this medium is a bit more straightforward than the scattering medium and kind of easier to use. The density and volume step length work pretty much the same as the other mediums. The denser the object is, the less light will penetrate it. The biggest difference we have in the random walk is the albedo node and the radius node. In the albedo node, you're simply telling Octane which color or image texture will be directly reflected from the outside surface of the object and scattered back to us from the inside of the object. Whatever you feed into the albedo is the color that is not being absorbed and is being scattered, which to me sounds more realistic than separating them. The radius tells Octane how deep the light will penetrate before it gets scattered. The default radius is one centimeter, so the light penetrates the object one centimeter and then starts to scatter, which means, as we know by now, we're going to be able to see into the material one centimeter deep and only then start seeing whatever we fed into the albedo channel. So if we crank the radius down to 0.01, we pretty much only get the albedo channel, no visible subsurface scattering at all. But if we start increasing the radius, light will penetrate deeper and deeper and the object will become more and more transparent and we see that only in the thicker parts of the object will still see the albedo color. However, once the radius is set to be larger than the thickest parts of the object, it becomes completely transparent. Now remember, this also depends on the density of the object. They're fully dependent on each other. If the density is set at 10 with radius at one centimeter and I bring up the radius to let's say 10, now the material is very transparent. But if I also multiply the density by the same amount, so I set it at 100, now we're back to the same look. It doesn't matter that much if we're only using numerical values in the radius, but it does help us if we attach a color node to the radius. So let's bring back the radius to one and set the density at 100. We have a pretty opaque object with some light penetration only visible on the thinner parts on the edges. Now let's plug in a color node to the radius and nothing has really changed. That's because the color is white, which in Octane pretty much translates as the number one, just the same as if we attach a float node set at one. So the radius node, I'm still telling it to use 1 as the centimeter value. If I look at the HSV color settings and play with the value, I'm doing the same thing as if I'm adjusting the radius number between 1 and 0, between black and white. Okay, so let's give it a color. Now you can see something different is happening. This basically tells Octane that instead of showing me a white light penetrating the object, and then scatter it into the albedo color. Only show me this color penetrating the object and then show me the albedo color. But how deep does the radius color go before it scatters into the albedo color? Well, the brighter the radius color is, the deeper it'll go because there's more white in it, which as we learned is translating into one. So the black color won't penetrate at all. And as I go brighter, the color penetrates more and more until it reaches white. And we know that that's one centimeter penetration. And this is where the density plays more of a role. If you want to get deeper than one centimeter in, you just lower the density. And you can see how that radius color penetrates deeper before it scatters into the albedo color. And you can get really complex and beautiful results blending two colors together like that. So the last node we have here is bias. This tells Octane which color will be shown more, the scattered color or the directly reflected color. 0.5 means they're being equally mixed. If I set it at zero, Octane will mostly show me the scattered colors from inside the material. And if I set it at one, Octane will mostly show me the directly reflected albedo color from the outside of the material. Okay, we're not done yet, because there's one aspect of the material quality that has an effect on the look of the subsurface scattering, the index of refraction. I won't go too deep into why it has an effect, mostly because I just don't know enough to explain it, but it has to do with the fact that the more reflective a material is, the more light reflects from it, right? Or even deflects from it. So that means the less light gets absorbed in it. The less light gets absorbed in it, the less light gets scattered and the less subsurface scattering effect there is. So just remember this, the higher the IOR values are, which kind of means that the object is more reflective, the less strong the SSS effect will be. That helps when sometimes you have this kind of an effect where all of a sudden part of the object won't show the SSS as much and you don't understand why, simply reduce the IOR and that most likely will fix it and create the more uniform SSS. Also on very low IORs, you're starting to get this spongy look like this material, for example, which is like the lightest material in the world. I always kind of saw it on YouTube and I thought this is a cool look and you can get that look by using the SSS with very low IOR all the way down to one. Now, the last thing we really want to consider is the transmissive type 
and transmission tab. Generally, dealing with scattering will make a transparent object more milky and diffused. But if we change the transmission type to diffuse, we're starting off with an already diffused material. That's going to be a good starting point if we're dealing with materials that are mostly opaque yet have some sort of a subsurface scattering like marble or wax or soap or sometimes even skin. Another thing about the diffuse transmission type is that technically the absorption medium can be used on almost any material because almost all the materials absorbed some light. The color we see here is the color that's not being absorbed, which means it's being directly reflected, which is dictated by the albedo channel. So for example, when the transmission type is set on diffuse and I crank the density all the way up to make the object as opaque as possible, all we get is the color of the albedo. And if I remove the transmission and give the albedo channel of the material the same color as the albedo color of the subsurface scattering, we get the same surface color, we get the same look. So technically you can use the diffuse type on the transmission and create a completely non subsurface scattered material, which will actually be more accurately true because again, almost all objects absorb some kind of light. Most cases, it's better to just use the albedo channel for opaque objects because it's faster to render and gives us more creative control over the look, even if it's not physically accurate. So up until now, we only used the SSS on fully transparent object, which means a universal material with black albedo, AKA no albedo, plus full on transmission or simply a specular material. But what happens if we add a color in the albedo channel? So let's add an orange color to the albedo channel. Uh, the medium is disconnected as you can see, so no SSS at all. And once we plug in the albedo color, something interesting happens. Some of the light is reflecting back to us as orange and the rest of it is being transmitted, which means we're getting the inverted color of the albedo being transmitted, in this case, blue. And of course, if we choose blue as the albedo, we're going to get orange as the transmitted color. If one color is reflected back, the opposite color is transmitted. Now, if we use that with the subsurface scattering, we can get some really unique results. We have a very low density object so that a lot of light will penetrate to get a pronounced SSS effect. And now you can see that we have the albedo color reflecting back to us the SSS albedo color being scattered on the inside and the inverted color of the main albedo being fully transmitted. And if we bring down the IOR to one, so we get no refraction at all, you can really see that a blue light is going all the way through the object, revealing what's behind it with this blue tint. Really dope and complex stuff to play with. Now, what if our IOR is extremely low, so we get no complex reflections, but we still wanna get reflections? Well, in that case, we can simply add a coating layer. This way, we keep the SSS look of low IOR, but we also get a complex specular layer that doesn't affect the SSS. And you can play with this like you would with the regular specular and roughness and set its own IOR, um, just for some added complexity and uniqueness. And to make things even more complex, we can tell Octane to only transmit a specific color. And now that color is not only transmitted, but is also heavily blending with the SSS albedo channel. Really beautiful. And by the way, if you want to be able to isolate the scattering effect in the live viewer, simply go to the render settings, go to the Octane tab, and in the render passes tab, make sure enable is checked and that SSS and transmission are checked in the beauty passes section. Then you'll have these tabs in the live viewer where you could simply view the SSS and transmission on their own. I got nothing in the transmission right now because my transmission type is set to specular. But if I set it to diffuse, you'll see that you get a slightly different SSS effect and also now you have info in the transmission channel. And now we can really start playing with everything we learned. So here I'm starting with a simple random walk, super low IOR, setting color to the transmission channel and adding some noise to the roughness channel for some imperfections. Then I'm copying the material, making transmission color full white, upping the IOR, changing density and actually using noise with a gradient node to give different colors to the SSS albedo. On the big object from behind, just playing with different colors and density. And on the right model, I'm plugging a color to the main albedo channel. And on that ring model, I'm setting very low density. So we really get a glassy look. And playing with different albedo colors, transmission colors, noises on different nodes. Some of them on albedo, some of them on the radius, different IORs using random walk as well as scattering medium to get different looks of the SSS. And I think I'll upload the non sped up version to the Patreon in case anybody wants to actually see the process. I wasn't going for anything too realistic, but obviously it's always rooted in photorealism. 
And that's a fun part of this whole thing, breaking the physical rules in a photorealistic world. That's where I always love to be. And eventually I ended up with this image. So next time I'll show you how to achieve real life materials that have SSS. Feel free to buy the SSS pack with 36 materials. Check out the Patreon and YouTube memberships. And that's it. I love you. Have a great day. Peace.